Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by BonusRound.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at bonusround.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, The Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury. Tell Us About Yourself, Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery, and how it illuminates cultural history. And their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. Benjamin Ingram. I'm originally from Florence, South Carolina, and right now I'm a business control specialist. Wonderful. All right. Um, and I'm going to click join. Let's go. All right. Who goes first? Let's go. Oh, we each have uh, to roll, right? Or do nah, I? Oh, I, think I go it's on first. Your side. Yeah, I just rolled. Okay, neat. Ben, who taught you how to play backgammon? My mom did. Were games important she... to you and your family? Actually, not really. Um. 
she just showed me the game one time as I was monkeying around in the cabinet and took out this board with the elongated triangles on it and said, hey, do you want to learn how to play? I said, sure. And she taught me how to do it. We would play Monopoly every now and then, but we didn't have a, a big old cabinet of games, although I had, I had always loved games when I was a kid. I was, when I was a kid, and when I say kid, I'll say like from the ages of like four to ten, my brother was into action figures and I was into board games. And even if even if I didn't have anyone to play with, I just liked having them and looking at them and like setting them up. And once in a while, I'd have a friend play. But really, I just yeah. liked having them around. Is that like true to your experience as well? Yeah, I was exactly the same. I got a younger brother and he was into Ninja Turtles and real Ghostbusters and all that kind of stuff. And now that I'm pushing 40, now I'm getting into that stuff. But I would always just want to play a game. I remember driving around uh, the game of life when I was a little kid, all that kind of stuff. And uh, gosh, what were some games I played against myself? I might have played backgammon against myself two or three times, but now it's good to have an opponent like you. But I, I'd always like seeing games on TV better than seeing those those cartoons where the world ends or something like that. Sure. Yeah, that always spoke to me more than like cartoons and stuff as well. And I'm you know, we're more or less like kind of in the same age bracket. Um, but I remember like the cartoons of like the nineties and they were all very like hectic and loud. And, you know, if you were lucky, some of them were funny. Like if you're talking about like, Nickelodeon, there were like funny cartoons, but other than that, and like the Simpsons, you know, but I just, yeah. game shows always spoke to me more than other forms of entertainment. I think because I loved learning and I loved games and I love all that. Was that true for you as well? Were you like a big game show kid? Yes. Uh, the first one I ever watched was Pressure Luck. I remember that distinctly. And, you know, what What better could a three-year-old want? You know, there are a lot of flashing colors. There are a lot of happy people. There was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of applause. And then you see a, a, a whammy, a cartoon run across the screen every now and then. You know, if you're three years old, you can't do any better than that. I remember my mom said that I would sit at the supper table going, big bucks, big bucks, and stop, and then slap the table. Yep. Until she told me to stop. But That's right. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd always appreciated those shows because, you know, it, everybody seemed to be happy on them. And, you know, some people would win, some people would lose, but everybody would leave happy because most of the people would leave having had a good experience. This wasn't like Masters of the Universe where the world could blow up or something like that. This wasn't Ninja Turtles where a giant rat or a, a brain inside of a cyborg could could threaten to flood the sewers or anything like that. Everyone was having a good time. And it was oh, very yeah. colorful, very loud, very lit. And I, I enjoyed all of them. I enjoyed all of them. Well, I relate specifically to what you're talking about because Press Your Luck was, it wasn't the first game show I remember watching. There were a few before that. But it was definitely the first one um, where, damn, I rolled double sixes. Uh, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Um, it was the first show that I remember being a fan of, like before I could identify what that meant. I, that was the first show I like look forward to watching. Like it just stayed in my head for a lot of the same reasons that you're describing. Like it's, 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 it's like all the base nutrients, right? It's like excitement <laughs> and it's laughter and it's like cartoons and it's lights. And there's like a hand-eye coordination kind of video game thing happening with the button. Like it's just everything. And yeah, to four-year-old me, that show was, it, it just, it really spoke to me and it really kind of showed me like what game shows can be. You, you, you can't beat that. And you know what? During uh, a recent illness that I had, my brother brought me a little toy whammy. And I took it in there with me and I was like, well, I, I hope this sucker didn't take all my money, but I guess he's not because he's in here with me. But uh, that, that did mean a lot. He, he remembered it. He remembered. Gosh, but all of those shows I appreciated. What am I doing wrong here? I roll that I can't move my pieces. Can't you? Oh, my God, because oh. I'm captured. I did not even realize it. Yeah, you got to bring your man down. did not even realize it. There we are. I there grab. we go. Okay. And then I do that. And now I got you. All right, cool. Yeah, you got me back. There we go. No, I just fan. I can't move. Is there an optimum strategy? Because I feel like this game is so open ended. Like you can go so many different ways, and there are so many ways of attacking like the goal of getting your pieces from one side to the other. Yes. Like, how do uh, you go about it? How do I go? I first of all, I wait for like the first two or three rolls. I know what to do on that. And if it, 
it depends. It depends on how I'm set up. You know, it's kind of like chess. Some people ad adopt an attacking formation. Some people adopt a slow game. Uh, th there's a lot of strategy in it, but there's not really an optimum because so much of it is based on the dice. I, I think that's what I like about it. it. It's very, very dynamic. You can have an 80% chance of winning and then you don't win. So th they say it's the cruelest game. They say it's also the sexiest game, but then again, you you and I are playing it. That's so true. Yeah, that's, that. that's out the window immediately. Yeah. I remember reading that Backgammon was a big fad like in the 60s. Like Hugh Hefner popularized it. It and was. Would, and yeah, it, they would play yeah. like at the Playboy Mansion. Yeah, and th they had a club in Los Angeles called Pips. And I think Lucille Ball bankrolled it. And a young man who was just, he came down from Canada. And I think you know where this is going. But he went in that club, see if he could play, and just got trounced by Lucille Ball. But Lucille Ball became a friend and a mentor of his. And this was around the time he was doing Wizard of Odds. And I mm -hmm. think it was just before he did High Rollers. So That's I right. think you know who I'm talking about. I know exactly who you're talking about. And I seem to remember that Lucille Ball stayed a fan of Alex Trebek for a long time. Even into High Rollers, she would come and surprise him on the set once in a while during tapings. I wish she would have come out and actually played the game. But Oh, right? Wouldn't that be incredible? <laughs> yeah, win some cashieroo while while we're at it. That's right. That's right. Um, tell me about Alex Trebek as he relates to you. Before you got a chance to become a contestant on Jeopardy and meet him and play the game, um, what did he what did he represent for you as a young person who liked games and liked game shows and I, I would assume also had a, had an appreciation for trivia. I, I think I had an appreciation for games before I had an appreciation for knowledge. And that was because the majority of the games that were on when I grew up in the 1980s, and I think this is also true today, when something good happened, you knew it. People would applaud, they'd flash a light, they'd ring a bell, some, like the scoreboard would change. When something good happened, people knew it. And at 7.30 at night, when Jeopardy came on, you knew that was out the window because you get a correct response, they change the scoreboard, you go right back into the game and pick another clue. So I knew that this game was pretty serious, but Mr. Trebek kept such a, a very, very affable and classy air about it that even as a little kid, I did not feel intimidated. The atmosphere was very intimidating, but it was very friendly. And I knew even as a little kid that watching this very, very difficult show I felt I had a friend in Alex Trebek, and I think everybody who watched felt the same also. Oh, for sure. And that's what came across um, to me when I was young and watching Jeopardy with my family as well. That, and, and maybe it's because I really enjoyed school. Like, I really loved that whole process of, like, going to school and, and, and learning and going to different classes, and I, I, just, I just loved it. Um, and so to see somebody like Alex Trebek on TV who was like authoritative yet friendly and intelligent, you know, that's like, he was like, he embodied the qualities I think of a, of a teacher that I would want at that age. You know what I mean? Somebody who can give you an appreciation for 19th century literature or, 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 or 1970s football. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just so many different yeah categories that come up in the course of a show and he presents each of them with such confidence and such authority like that you know i don't know there's like uh like, there's a meme that's like if i um, if i were to go to school i wish these would be the teachers and this would be the subject like all <laughs> of that would be jeopardy do you know what i mean like to me that's just like the oh, perfect yeah. format for learning you know yeah and when, when trebek looked authoritative that was genuine i think he had a, a genuine appreciation for knowledge uh it, it wasn't just a persona that he brought across on the show. It was very, very genuine. And I think that's proven out by, I mean, if you watch him in the seventies, there was a question, I think on that high rollers drunken episode. I don't think he was drunk at all. Uh, some people say he was, but he wasn't. There, there was something about William Howard Taft. There were, and nobody got him. He was like, was he the president who got stuck in the bathtub? And like one person laughed, but he knew it. I don't think that story was true, but, uh, Trebek thought it was, I, I, I guess, but I think he truly loved it, it, it. was a perfect fit with Jeopardy because he truly loved the game. He truly respected it. I believe he respected the players of it. And 
I think that came from a genuine desire to be a lifelong learner, which he most certainly was. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that he also, uh, something that he kind of trumpeted when he did interviews about the show and about, especially during like the Ken Jennings era where everybody was fascinated with, you know, how many is he going to win? How, how does he know all that stuff? You know, he, he, he made no secret of it, that the trick is to read as much as you can about anything to, even if you don't find it interesting, you know, just the act of ingesting information and having it ready in your brain. Like that's what makes, that's what makes a good Jeopardy contested. I mean, it, it, does that fit at all into the way in which you prepared to be on Jeopardy? Like, how did you, how did you get to that point? How did you study for that? Uh, learning stuff that I did not want to learn, I'll admit I did not start doing that until I realized, oh my gosh, I've got a chance to be in the Tournament of Champions. You know, I, I got the call. I, I, I had always been interested in the things I was interested in, if that makes sense. Sure. And you know, what are those? World... What are some of those things that you're interested in? Oh, gosh. We had a big world book encyclopedia growing up, you know, that green and beige uh, set of volumes. Right. Uh, I would just thumb through those. I, I think I was mostly interested in geography and in history, a little bit in mathematics, maybe a touch in science. But I just like things that could tell a story and they could easily relate to other things. And also like looking at maps. <laughs> you know, we had the, uh, the the placemats with the U.S. map, the world map and all that kind of stuff. I still go back to that. I think of Colorado as yellow. I think of South Carolina as green. <laughs> I think of Georgia as kind of a light pink. Uh, I, I guess that's how I, I learned these things. I know that Monica wrote a paper about that recently. Uh, I was not a part of that study, but the way people remember things in a weird way, I think describes me pretty well. And so when I tried out, actually my wife made me do it. She said, take the test. I had taken it once before, uh, but this time I took it and I went out there just saying, well, there's no real need to study because there's hardly a chance that any of this stuff that I'm learning is going to come up. But I went out there and I got the result that I did, which I did not expect. And then they said, well, we'll see you for the tournament of champions. I said, oh, grand and good. And then I see that the other players come on and start playing very well. Jared Hall, Terry O'Shea, uh, Sandy Baker went on there and, and, and won a lot. And of course, Arthur Chu and Julian Collins. That motivated me more than anything else. I felt like such a mercenary, but that motivated me. And I learned about, uh, I, I'd always been interested in classical music, but not opera. And I took up opera and that's a good subject to learn because you get a lot of bang for your buck. They don't ask about too many operas on the program, but if you learn them, then you'll have them. So it's a small investment in time, but it can pay off big rewards. My worst category was visual art. I think that later became a strength. Uh, literature is still pretty bad, uh, but it got a little bit better. I try to get good at like, you know, today's music, today's television, today's movies, today's comic books, all that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe I just still live in the past, but I, I, I didn't get very good at the popular culture type stuff. But what I learned served me well, I believe, on the program. And it served me well in life. I, I, I'm now very, very interested in visual art and sculpture and painting and music and all that kind of stuff. So I feel very enriched beyond just the results that I got from the television program. So in a way, my education is just beginning. That's a wonderful way of looking at it. I, You know what's funny? Talking about um, popular culture and trivia, I got to interview David Madden a few weeks ago, and he's heavy into the academic competitive quiz scene, and he puts on... Uh, quiz bowl competitions all over the world, travels the world doing it. And we were talking about the sort of pantheon of trivia, how there are these commonly accepted blocks of information that make up that, you know, that manual of like what to know as a professional quizzer, what to know as a, as a, as a quote unquote good trivia player. And we started talking about what would make it in these days and why some things haven't been how, why some subjects haven't been as accepted as others. And I think if I were to rephrase what I was asking him, I think I would want to know at what point do things like hip hop music, 
or video game history. At what point do things like that, which are very popular, enter that pantheon of knowledge? Like, at what point is that as valid as the Great Lakes or the Great Operas or, uh, you know, Academy Award winners? You know what I mean? Like, at what point is oh, that yes. worth knowing? Like, when, when do we get to a point where that will come up with some regularity? Gosh. First of all, it depends on who's running the game. You know, some people think that Shakespeare is more important than V.S. Napal, when that's not necessarily so. I believe that they're equally important in, in terms of literature. Uh, some folks think that Fidelio is more important than Einstein on the beach, but to me, they are equally important. Uh, there's not a piece of information out there that is not important in its own little way. I play a lot of bridge, or at least I used to, and... If you can find out that your opponent has like the deuce of clubs, like an insignificant card, that's information that might be able to help you in the long run. So as far as when people might start studying like hip hop and all that kind of stuff in a university, well, of course that's happening now, but gosh, when, when will it, you're trying to find out when it will become high art or low art. I don't think there's such a thing as high art or low art. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah, neither yeah. do I. But I think that in the in the um in that sphere, I think there is that notion that things like popular culture when it comes to music, when it comes to entertainment, are sort of lowbrow and the things that have been asked for decades are highbrow. Like I wonder if we will as people who are into this kind of thing, I wonder if we will live to see a shift there. That'd be kind of cool. That'd be pretty cool. One reason I never got into like, you know, today's music was when I was growing up, uh, it, it was something, you know, all the cool kids did. You know, I, I, I didn't really understand, you know, Nirvana, Green Day, Mad Caddies, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I kind of like the fringe music a little bit, you know, stuff that you might hear on Lookout Records, some that you might hear on Naxos. Uh, I just like listening and watching things that nobody else watched. I guess part of me was thinking, if I want to learn more about mainstream music, I don't think there is such a thing as mainstream anymore. And I think that's been true since about the 1990s. I can just ask somebody else if I want to know about it. But nobody's watching these old game shows on YouTube, although people definitely are now. Oh, yeah. Uh, nobody's visiting, you know, I, I think of Randy Amage's Few site. I think I pronounced that right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I've always been interested in stuff that nobody else wants to learn about. So I, I don't consider pop culture to be lowbrow. I know that you're not insinuating that I do. I've just never had an interest in it, I guess, because everyone else has. And maybe I'm a contrarian by nature. That's interesting. Yeah, sort of like the road less traveled. And I think that I, I, I identify that to a certain degree as well. Um, in most of the entertainment that I enjoy, I like the stuff that I can surprise somebody with, especially when it comes to music. I love being the one yeah. that can introduce music to somebody. That to me is like, I think that if you share music and you share food with somebody, those are like the two most beautiful gestures I think that you could perform in an interaction with somebody else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, there's just oh, something yeah. so intimate about those things that uh, to me doesn't apply to anything else. There's just something so beautiful about that act of sharing those things. Yeah, gosh, I know nothing about food. I, I was so bad at I think I had a food category, didn't get a single one right. Liz was all mad. Said, how, how did you not know that? She wasn't mad, but uh, she's she's very much a real foodie, and she's gotten me interested in all these different dishes and cultures and everything else, and I'm, I'm learning more about it. I grew up a picky eater. I don't think I am so much anymore, but I guess we all have our little taste. I need to learn more about food. As a trivia person, do you learn more about food by reading about it or by eating it? By eating it. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm not interested in reading about food. I'll put yeah, it like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. I, 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 I can imagine. Because I'm thinking about, uh, you mentioned a little while ago the subjects that you thought you were poor in. You mentioned visual art as one that was a weakness but eventually became a strength. And I can imagine that learning about visual art must be really fun and enriching like to to identify these different paintings and identify styles and eras and you know what a what a certain artist was going through when he painted this or when she painted this yeah. and, um you know it, it's just a very um 
that's a deep dive that you can go on. Yeah, and, and putting it into context of the history of the world at the time. You know, Guernica wouldn't have meant as much if it hadn't been painted when it was, nor would have been painted if it didn't happen when it did, that kind of thing. So it's another way of telling a story is is the way I've put it. Right. A good game, by the way. That was close. Yeah. That was a good I'm one. For game two, I reckon. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> two nothing Crawford. Let's go. I love it. Um, tell me about when you decided to become a Jeopardy contestant. You mentioned that your wife kind of encouraged you to take the test. What made you see that process through? Because a lot of people, I think, especially when it comes to Jeopardy, a lot of people get intimidated by that process, by the test, and then the second test, and then the interview, and then you, you know, I remember when I took it years ago, I had to go to a hotel in New York for the next step, and even that was sort of intimidating. Cool. Like, what made you see that whole process through? I was intimidated myself, to be honest. Um, the first time I tried out was when the brain bus came to Asheville, North Carolina. And that was about an hour from my undergrad. I went to Wofford College. And I was, at, I, I think I was a junior at the time, maybe a senior. And I drove up there and they had the 10 quest, question screening test. And my roommate persuaded me to go up there and take it. I took it and I failed. And then I drove to Durham, North Carolina to visit a friend of mine at Duke. And this is actually a very interesting move, by the way. Uh, I'll do that. It's kind of a risky move, but I, I think it'll work. Oh, but anyway, like double I drove to Duke eight. and we had a big party and I, I went to sleep in this guy's dorm room. I woke up next morning and uh, the sports report was on and it said Pacers this, Pistons that, final with 50 some seconds left. I, I was, how could it be a final with 50 some seconds left? And then the clock tick over to something o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever it was. And they were like, here are the headlines. It was the night that the person who was then known as Ron Artest ran into the stands and uh, started beating up the wrong guy. Oh, so I remember that. Ask, yeah. So when people ask, where were you when that happened? I said, I was trying out for Jeopardy the first time. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd always been encouraged to to learn more things and to, I guess, express what I learned in, a, in my own way, I guess. My mom encouraged me to try out for the quiz bowl team. It was kind of a modified quiz bowl thing. In middle school, I've been interested in the old geography bee, although I never went to stage with Alex Trebek, but that's all right. Uh, I played quiz bowl in middle school, high school, played in college, did pretty well. I think I was too conservative most of the time. But after that was over with, I was like, well, that's a, that's a cool chapter in my lifetime to turn the page. Then I met Liz, and uh, a couple of months after we met, I was up visiting her, and she was online and said, hey, you know, the Jeopardy test is tonight. I think you ought to take it. And I said, no, I, I don't. I, there, there's no need for me to take that. It's just going to be a waste of time. But in reality, I was intimidated by the process. I knew what it was. I'd read about it. I'd followed some contestant stories just because I was interested in them. They, they just make good stories. But she said, do it anyway. I said, I don't want to. She said, no, nah, just do it anyway. She was right. I, I took that test in her apartment looking out over Main Street in Spartanburg, South Carolina, not far from where I graduated with uh, with an undergrad degree from Walford. So uh, that that pretty much did it. I actually got the email saying that I would have an audition when I was in India. And I I was lonely. I missed everybody. And I checked my spam folder. I was there on a job. I was so lonely, I checked my spam folder. And they said, here's a note from Jeopardy Productions. Uh, you've been invited to an audition. Please reply within 48 hours. I checked the timestamp. It was sent 46 hours before. So that was pretty darn close. And I actually tried out in Baltimore after I got back. And the night before I tried out, I was almost run over by a light rail train. So that was pretty darn close. And so before the audition, I said, you know, I don't want to mess this up. So I drank two gin and tonics. Just to make sure that, that everything would there you go, go. All right. Yeah, and that'll do I, it. I, I guess it did. I guess it did. I, you the, know, the it, audition was... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the audition was a very, very smooth process, and they, they made it a lot of fun. Now, I, I thought it was kind of corny at first. Like, everybody stand up and cheer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But after a while, I think it took about an hour or two. You've been through one of these. You get oh, yeah. into it after a while. It, they, they make it so much fun and, and so chill and... You know, you can make friends doing that. It, it's it's oh. a very positive experience. Oh, Would it really agree? is. Oh, my God, 100%. Yeah. And even, you know, 
uh, even just the act of being in a room with people who like the show and like what the show represents as much as you do oh, yes. to me, that's like a, um, it's like a healing experience in a way. It, it's great. It's like good for your soul. I, I compare it to like going to a concert for like a really obscure artist and suddenly you're in an audience of like 200 people <laughs> who know that artist. Do you know what I mean? There's something, yeah. there's something like joyous about that. Yeah, it, it was very, very special. Uh, even just getting to play the mock game. I'm glad that they got rid of the thing where uh, if you take the test and you don't pass, then you have to go. I can see why they did that in the first place out when they gave the test in, uh, I guess, the old Hollywood Center Studios. I guess I can see why they did that because it would save time. But they don't do that anymore. It, it's it's very, very positive. At least I was when I auditioned back in 2012. It was December 1st, 2012. That's That's a date I won't forget. Sure. Oh, I think the process is still very positive. I just went through. I'm, I'm in the contestant pool, and actually, as soon as you mentioned okay. the thing about checking your uh, uh, your spam, I picked up my phone and checked mine. Any um, luck? No, no, no. Maybe. Oh, maybe too next bad. time. Yeah, that's all right. I'm I'm in the pool for like the next two years, but um, I had the last step of my audition back in uh, was it August or September? I went to SporkleCon in D.C. and uh, part of it was was the last step of the uh, of the audition. Um, and yeah, very encouraging, very, um, I think just a very safe space for people who can easily be very nervous and very intimidated. I was very nervous and very intimidated, but that's when the gin and tonics kicked in. There you go. <laughs> so I, I guess I handled it differently than some other folks, but gosh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Is Jeopardy a sport? I don't believe it is. Uh, when I was out there for the Invitational Tournament, more than one champion gave me a very persuasive argument that it is. Uh, as, as far as a quiz show, it's definitely the best on the dial today. And it's definitely the most rigorous. It's definitely the most difficult. It is definitely the one that requires the most emotional investment, which is something that not too many people talk about these days. But that, unfortunately, doesn't make it a sport. It, it's a hell of a game. It's, it's one of the best games on TV ever, if not the best, but it's not a sport. And I just don't see the artistry, the creativity, the strategy that you see in other sports, even like chess and bridge, which are sports. Uh, there is a lot of hard work that goes into it, and it's good to be in good physical condition when you play, but... There's not much in the way of strategy, except maybe it's an Amy Schneider versus Andrew He situation, and you know the other player and you can strategize. I was only in one such a situation like that. I played a guy named Hunter Sanderson, a very, 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 very good player. And the first time we played, we got a tie. I underwagered, and he wagered the tie, and I got it right, he got it wrong, and we met in the middle. It was a tie. So we had to play each other again because back, back then you were co-champions. You did it all over again. And it wound up being – do you know what a shore game is? Uh, I can explain I don't, don't think know. I do. Yeah, if you could. Yeah. You, you know what's funny? Sitting watching these games uh, for the Invitational Tournament, I'd be watching and be like, oh, that's a shore. That's a Stratton. That's, uh, that's a two-thirds. The other players wouldn't know what I was talking about, but they knew exactly what to wager in that situation. I guess I learned it differently. But anyway, a short game is when first and second are pretty close and third is a little bit farther behind. The second place player might wager short in order to keep the third place player locked out. And that's something that has been bantering around the message boards as well as some of the websites uh, for a long time. The fellow who came up with his name, Bob Shore. So I had a $200 lead over Hunter in first place. He was in second. Karen O'Donnell was in third with a, a certain amount, that, which was less than half of Hunter's. So what I was thinking was, well, what's Hunter going to do? If Hunter makes the book move, he will wager small and try to lock out Karen in third. If he wagers small, then I wager small, and then I can lock him out. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Wait, what the hell was that? Oh, you timed out. You timed out of our game. Oh, I timed out. Oh, that's okay. I don't mind. 
just just oh. talking about it. Wonder what our rating was. Yeah, we'll rematch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I just I, I just I know how um like just from seeing you interact, I just know how important games are to you. And I thought this would be like a fun way to kind of just facilitate <laughs> a conversation. Also, I haven't played backgammon in a while and I love it. It it is fun. Gosh, you're a hell of a player. Listen, got, Bob Haig some... taught me everything I know. I don't know. I, I, he taught me everything. I need some better numbers. <laughs> yeah, it's the dice right. is really what it's up to. Oh, you got that right. That's for sure. But anyway, uh, I, I, I digressed way too much. So I had a small lead over second. Second had a big lead over third. I'm pretty sure that Hunter thought that I would believe that he would wager by the book because I knew he was a good player. But then again, Hunter knows I'm a good player. He knows that I will believe that he will wager small by the books, so he might wager big. So I didn't know what this guy was going to do. So right. I had to think about him. I thought, well, he's that good. He'll use the double, double, reverse, reverse, uh, triple option psychology on me, and he's probably going to wager big. And that's exactly what he did. He wagered big. It is, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. So you at the at the beginning of Final Jeopardy, you had sixteen thousand. He had fifteen thousand eight hundred. Um, and your category was Saints on the map, which for a trivia person, oh. for you, you know, for trivia people, that's a pretty. I mean, that's a gimme, right? Because we're talking. Okay, in population, it's the largest U.S. city with the same Spanish name as a current Western Hemisphere capital. It's a little that's bit a of a one. brain teaser. Yeah, it's a little tough. But to me, geography is one of those things that, like, if you're going to become a Jeopardy contestant, you have to be so solid in your knowledge of the map. And you talking mm -hmm. about how much you love maps, I mean, I, I imagine that was that was probably a, a, a strength for you. It, it was indeed. And most Final Jeopardies are about geography, history, literature, maybe a couple of Oscar winners in there, the, the, the serious stuff. And they require just a little bit of lateral thinking. And maybe I just think weird that way, but that, that might be why it played into a, I, I'm not going to call it a strength so much as a saving grace, because in the original games I played, I played nine of them. Let's see, two of them were locks. And in six of the remaining seven, I had to get Final Jeopardy right to even have a dog's chance. So I would definitely call it a saving grace. And he did exactly what you said. Yeah, he bet it all. Yeah. And yeah, you bet just and enough to I, win by a dollar. Yep. I won by a dollar. I had a $200 lead, which is a Jeopardy quantum, or I guess maybe $5 is a quantum. And I wound up winning by a dollar. But that was really the only strategic thought that I had. Uh, one thing about people calling Jeopardy a sport, I, I, I know that, that Mr. Davies wants to call it a sport. It's definitely the closest game show to a sport. But to me, it, it seems like that might intimidate some folks saying, oh, my gosh, I'm on here playing a sport. Yeah, that makes for very good television. But gosh, I just think about the emotional aspect of the game. You know, it, 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 it's pretty darn tough to be up there. I don't care how many times you play the video game. I don't care how many episodes you watch. When you're up there on stage, something different happens to you. It definitely happened to me. And. I don't know how I was able to overcome it, but it's interesting because in the first game, I was sweating like a pig. They they gave me they give you those little half pint sized bottles of water just to kind of wet your whistle between the commercials. Sure, I downed every last one of them. I I must have drunk a gallon of water those first five shows when I was up there because I taped Monday through Friday and then right, right, right. a whole week's worth of shows in a day. I never got tired, but I did get very very thirsty. And so the makeup uh, mistress said, you know, pat yourself down with this between the commercials because you're starting to glisten a little bit. I did not take her advice. Uh, I, I, I just had to handle it my own way. But it is intimidating up there. I can I can assure you of that no matter how many times you've done it. Oh, and I've never been on Jeopardy, but I've been in similar situations where, yes, no matter how much you watch the show, no matter how much you practice, you 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 play the game, you play the home game. Nothing can prepare you for that. Um, well, I think the only thing that can prepare you is if you have some kind of background in public speaking or being on stage. Like I was a theater kid all throughout high school and it shaped a lot of my personality. It shaped a lot of my desires and my goals and my ambitions. But it also 
when it came time to be a contestant on a game show, um, I was attuned to that level of performance already. Do you know what I mean? Like that to oh, me. Yeah. And, and I think about that era of my life is like, I really credit those years, like in theater workshop as giving me a lot of the skills that brought me to wherever I was fortunate enough to be taken later on in life. I feel I, like that's I, I the only so thing. Too. Yeah. That's the only thing I think that can even come close to preparing you for that type of, of performance. Did you have that at all? Did you have any kind of anything that would sort of uh, foreshadow uh, an opportunity to perform or be like the guy on stage? I did do a little bit of children's theater. I didn't take that into adulthood. I tried to sign up for it in college, but it was full. So I took music instead to, I think, my everlasting credit uh, because it opened up a whole new world for me, not just as a quiz show contestant, but just period. So I'm, I'm glad that that happened back at Wofford. Uh, I haven't really been on the stage since then, but I did marry a theater major who was now a nurse. And those two professions are, are rather similar in a way. So I do Ooh, appreciate I would love to know how. Who, Huh. Well, gosh, she could probably tell you better than I, but, you know, when you're on stage, you have to communicate an idea to someone in a, in, in sort of a special way that, that they'll understand it and they'll appreciate it. When you're a nurse, you kind of have to do the same thing. You don't just care for a patient. You make sure that that patient can care for themselves after they leave the hospital or after they leave whatever setting you're in. And that's something that she's very, very good at. And I think that comes from a theater background as well. Interesting. Yeah. And there's I also could vulnerability definitely... as well, e e even in the profession. There, there, there very much is. Sure. Sure. Oh, you have to be, you have to be, as a nurse, you have to be vulnerable and you have to be, um... oh God, everything that you said. Yeah. I can see those parallels. That makes total sense. I think about it. I mean, I have a career in hospitality. I've been working in hotels for almost a decade now. And to me, I noticed a lot of uh, parallels between the hospitality industry, at least to the degree in which I do it. Like I'm, I'm a front desk manager, um, that type of hospitality and broadcasting, which is what I've always wanted to do. Like both of them, I get to wear a suit. I get to be that like welcoming <laughs> kind of like point of contact and, you know, um, yeah. you know, greet people, find out a little bit about them. Like that's in the absence of the opportunity to be a game show host working in that industry fed a lot of the hunger I had for what I now realize are like the base nutrients of that, of that job. Do you know what I mean? We're like, I don't oh, know yeah. that I want to be Bob Barker. I think I want to be somebody who talks like him, who dresses like him, who has the same sort of social ability. I, I admire that, you know, and maybe that's just part of growing up. Right. Yeah. I, I had always wanted to be, uh, gosh, maybe not Bob Barker. Maybe Art James. I don't know. Maybe he was the one. He had that Art very James deep, was a rich, great host. Voice. Yes. Yeah. Just lay back, let the game be the star. You know, he didn't, the, the, the jokes he cracked, well, sometimes he'd crack a joke every now and then, but he was just Art James. You know, that, that that's the one who comes to mind. He, he didn't really come on my TV very, very much. We didn't get catchphrase. We didn't get Canadian TV. Uh, we did watch Mall Rats, and I didn't remember him from there. <laughs> but, uh, sure, sure, yeah. sure. I think a lot maybe, of people do. Yeah. yeah, other than Alex Trebek, of course. He was just smooth, just smooth, especially wow. with some of those crazy games that he had to deal with back in the old days. Oh, yeah, the Magnificent Marble Machine. Oh, yeah. God, with oh, a 20 I'm sorry about foot that. long pinball tape. Oh, God, incredible. Yeah, what yeah. A what a forgotten name in the history of like of, of TV. There are so many of those of those hosts that were so good and so smooth and seemed to have been on TV so often back then that are just forgotten names now. I mean, even Art Fleming, the original host of Jeopardy, he oh, gets a mention boy. nowadays because the show is like in its, you know, 60th anniversary celebration or whatever. So once in a while you hear his name. Um, but it's more as like a point of trivia or fascination than anything else he's just like a forgotten tv star and it's really a shame because he was another one that yeah. was like so good I, I would like to see somebody like you or bella or jay sack or pack or maybe bob put on a scuba suit and dive to the bottom of the east river and get those tapes back because that's just such a loss it's just such a loss and i think he would be even better remembered today 
But I know that I, 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 he, he was not the person who said, you know, give the new Jeopardy a chance. He didn't like the new Jeopardy, which is today's Jeopardy. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's true. He, he wasn't a fan. Didn't like, well, I think uh, two things that's, that, that didn't sit right with him, and this is just from hearing him talking about it in interviews. Uh, he did one with Bob Costas once where he talked about uh, the new Jeopardy and that he didn't like yeah. one that just in general, the questions were easier and dealt more with pop culture than they did with, you know, literature or the arts or, and also the idea that only the first place player got to keep their money, which he thought was sort of cheap. Because back in the day, in the 60s, 70s, when the show was on NBC, you won whatever was in front of you. And there's a story about the first few years of Jeopardy where a contestant got on the show and just wanted to win enough to buy an engagement ring for his girlfriend. So he yeah. busted for the first few and then just put his button down for the rest of the show. Like, I got what I need. Yeah, but I, I do remember Alex Trebek made a good point saying that, you know, now that the show was 10 times as valuable, you're, you're going to see people reach to like four or $5,000, which was a lot of money back then. I mean, it is today, for goodness sakes. It was even more in the 80s. And just put their signaling device down, go to the jewelry store and get their engagement ring. Somehow that doesn't make for as exciting a game, especially in the go-go 80s, especially in nighttime syndication or pre-prime syndication, which is where Merv Griffin wanted this in the first place. I can see the point that only the winner keeps the cash. Yeah, I think it I does do make too. for more interesting theoretical situations too. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, 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 not at all, not at all. But I, but I agree with you, and yeah, I think I'm going to speak to what you were just going to say that it zaps the uh, uh, the wagering strategy. You're not competing against anyone anymore. Now it's just you know how much do you know about the subject, how much are you willing to put forward, and it takes out that uh, like the interpersonal, like the competition of it. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. I, I mean. The wagering in Jeopardy is a, a a psychological game on its own. It is. If you're in a two-thirds situation, uh, or definitely in a shore, or maybe in a Stratton or a legitimate choice, I think that's where the artistry comes in. Because I think of strategy as being, I, I think it was General Marshall who wrote that a strategist has the way the fourth fits all around the circle. In other words, if you're playing like Twilight Struggle, you can make a play for Afghanistan or try to shore up South Korea. You can't do both at the same time. Right. If you're playing defense and football, you can uh, go back into quarters coverage or you can engage eight. You can't do both at the same time. If you're playing backgammon, sometimes you can spring a back checker or you can make an inside point. You can't do both at the same time. And what decision do you make with limited resources? I think that's what strategy yeah. is. I guess that comes into play in Final Jeopardy. But most of the time, your decision is made for you, especially if you assume that the person in the lead in a very small lead, like two thirds or, or, or greater, uh, is going to make the shutout wager. But not everybody does. I knew Drew Horwood did not. He had that sixth sense. He, he was in the, the 2014 Tournament of Champions. Uh, he won eight games, but he didn't win that much money. But he had that sixth sense. When to wager $2, when to wager $4, when to... Uh, you know, when to go short, when to go long. He knew when the tough categories were going to come up. And I think he had a very good card sense about his opponents. Colby Burnett has that too. We saw that in the decades. There are other players like that as well. Uh, maybe if I played more like them, I would think this game were more like a sport. But I just didn't have that. I was like a bull in the china shop. I would just make the same wager every time. So I think I'm a pretty predictable player. I, I don't think I'd make a good um, a good bridge defender, in other words. So maybe that has something to do with my opinion about whether this game is a sport or not. I'm starting to rethink that now. <laughs> well, it's funny because I'm starting to rethink what I'm feeling too because it does seem to me that it has the qualities of a sport in that there are statistics and there are, you know, there are there are strategies that I think are both physical and psychological. And, and this is coming from somebody who admittedly knows nothing about sports. So I'm really just sort of identifying... <laughs> what I think, you know, the things have in common. But I think that you raise some great points too. There isn't that open-ended ability to um, uh, 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 invoke a strategy the way there is in something like chess or something, like you said, like backend. You know, there's really one way or to skin a cat. And, oh, yeah. Oh, even password. Even something yeah. like password, which I think password and pyramid are closer to sports if we're going to talk about game shows. 
are closer to sports than Jeopardy is. And I think even I, think I would you might be right. I would say especially Pyramid because in Jeopardy, there's one way to skin that cat, right? You get the clue, you give the correct response, you move on. That's that's what you do. There's no clever way to do that. There's no, like you said, artistry involved in getting to that point. You either know it or you don't know it, and now we're moving on to the next. But in something like chess, in something like pyramid, where you're allowed to communicate however you want, as long as you don't say that word that's on the screen, there is absolutely an element of sport in games like that. Yeah, and sometimes it pays to break the rules, if you know what I mean. It, in Jeopardy, it's not a circle, it's a line. You have one goal and one goal only to try to outscore your opponents to get into a good position into final Jeopardy. That's it. And you don't have to make any sacrifices in order to do that. You have to work hard to prepare to do that, yeah. but you don't have to... Some, there's no occasion where getting one wrong on purpose helps, except if you get into a lock tie and then the game's don't tie anymore, so that doesn't matter. So there's no time to break the rules, make, a, make sort of an off-the-wall play. There might be in password because in the old Alan Ludden version, you couldn't pass. So you might give a rotten clue for the first clue and then try to pick it up on the eight point clue. I that, like the, that, that's I, something that you see every now and then. Yeah, that's true. And I, like I don't know what decision. Adam would think about that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure I'll find out. Um, yeah, I like that decision to pass or play because it adds like a, a like, again, a psychological element to the game. Do I think my opponent will get will guess that word and is it worth gambling so that i get two clues i think i'm thinking of it in password plus terminology that if you pass yeah. and they get it wrong you get to give two clues for it i i yeah. really like that the same thing i think with family feud as well that that again that decision to pass or play i, I think that mark goodson introduced that concept into a lot of his into a lot of his game shows it's a very interesting conceit do i think my opponent can do it it's in Password, it's in Family Feud, it's in Card Sharks. It's, you know, that, that pass or play is very, um, a simple decision with a lot of very, um, damn, I have three seconds left on my clock. Um, <laughs> this it, game it, ain't rated, don't worry yeah. about it. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, I want to, I want to maintain my low rating. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, but it's a simple decision with very far reaching sort of consequences as far as the game is concerned. It's really interesting mechanic. Yeah, you see it in bridge sometimes too. You know, you make a sacrifice or you just let them stew in their own juice, that kind of thing. Right. But you know what's funny? Like one Christmas stuff, I got to get my mom a present. So I stopped at the gas station and got a copy of Password, like the new card game. And she got into it. She, she She's watching the episodes from the current series from Alan Ludden. She even found an ABC episode. And she she's into that show. And that has helped... Uh, that's helped me that in the tournament of champions when i gave her my guest ticket uh, I, I feel even more close to her now and so that's certainly helped a lot so game shows bring us all a little bit closer in a way but she liked the play pass option she wishes there were more abc shows that were still on tape so you got to go find them get, get oh, your wetsuit man. on jump in i would love to. wonderful <laughs> i would love to that's one of my um that's one of my holy grail shows i could just that era of password and you know it's funny because that era of game shows in general i'm talking like 72 to about 76 with the yeah. exception of the big names and the really you know the really popular shows the, a lot of that doesn't exist so when little bits of it pop up and you know little elements of it are rediscovered it's like a window into a whole different era of game shows that isn't rerun anymore they're just so uh sunny and so, you know, you talk about yeah. uh, the positive qualities of game shows. It's that like amped up to eleven. I mean, it's so colorful, and 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 they were never ashamed of the fact that you know you might have been watching the show yesterday. They weren't ashamed of the fact that you know we taped one a few minutes ago, and this is this is the Wednesday show. Hey, happy Wednesday! They'd say at the, like the top of a show because there wasn't that fear of like, oh, we can't rerun this. And I think that yeah, that, that liquor helped. Oh yeah! All oh, did it ever? <laughs> did it ever? Did yeah. it ever? Yeah, I, I think that's starting to swing back because you know, match game. You were on there, and we just had a good time watching. I know it wasn't all about the money. Oh yeah, no, not at all. But as, yeah. and, and that was another show where they were serving drinks. They the oh. they had yeah they had servers go around on the commercial break, not to us, but to the celebrities. Oh, and they had trays Dang. and drink. I know that's all right. Oh, you, honestly, you I make I, it a challenge. I couldn't have done any 
worse at that game if I tried. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's hard the... coming up with punchlines. That's kind of a sport in a way. It's really hard. And I, that's yeah. something that's come up in a lot of these other episodes too, where I talk about Magic Game being a really easy game. You can hear Strawberry Blank and go, oh, shortcake, and then you win. It, that's all fine and well. But when you add the element of being in studio or being yeah. uh, in front of the cameras, under the lights, in front of celebrities, in front of an audience, that makes it more difficult. That, to me, is the game. It's like a oh, mental goodness, gymnastics, yeah. you know? Yeah, that and the human element. You see that in Jeopardy, too, because humans write the clues. I know that they randomly select the boards and they put the categories together right before the random selection. But there's a lot of luck in Jeopardy, just as there is in Match Game. There's a whole lot of luck in Jeopardy. I think I'm living proof of that. Oh, absolutely you are. And how fortunate do you feel? Um, Very. Being on that, I, I, I imagine. But yeah. being on that list of people that get that call back, I mean, you won your eight games back in 2013. Then you were called back for the Tournament of Champions, won a quarter of a million dollars for the champion in, uh, was that 2014? It yeah, was. 2014, right. And then you were called back in 2019 as a team captain for the All-Star Games. Then you were called back this year to compete in the Invitational. Like, how fortunate do you feel being on that short list of players that Jeopardy can call on to come back and play this game that you enjoy and even win a little bit of money? You have to feel so great about that. I do. I, I'll admit I do. I Fortunate is the word. I think lucky might be the word, too. For a long time, I thought that everything had an explanation and that we could find it, we humans. Uh, I still believe everything has an explanation, but there are some things that we just cannot figure out. You know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes to mind. There are some things that we just cannot figure out. And I go back and I think about all of the opportunities that have been presented to me by this program, and I cannot figure out how I took advantage of them, except maybe like one or two of them. Uh, the final comes to mind, uh, the, the one about uh, FDR and Hoover, not Hoover, uh, Coolidge and Harding and Cox uh, in game one of the finals of 2014. Right. I just happened to be reading a book about that uh, just for giggles. And then they asked about that. And something else I was fortunate was that I was so far behind. So I knew I was going to wager everything. And. I had time to think about the clue while Arthur Chu and Julia Collins had to think about wagering not only against me, but against each other. So it was serendipitous that I was so far behind at that point because I had time to think about it. What are they going to think? What are they going to ask about? It's presidential elections. Who ran the most times? Well, Nixon did and somebody else did. That was FDR. So I had FDR on the mind. And then that comes up. I was like, well, FDR ran against both Harding and Coolidge. That's it. So I, I, I knew that one instantly. But that was just grand good fortune is what it was. I, I, I cannot explain where that came from. I've had the uh, pleasure, the privilege of talking to many other contestants who have appeared on Jeopardy. And I've talked to many notable contestants who have won dozens of games. And, uh, you know, Jeopardy served as a launch pad for their trivia career, for their game show career. And I tend to ask if that first win gives you a boost of confidence and makes the subsequent games easier. And some contestants have said, yes, it does. Some contestants have said it never gets any easier. And no matter how many games you win, at the end of the day, you're still the returning champion. You're still in that situation. You're still on the set, holding the button, looking at the board, playing the game. That doesn't get any easier. Where does your response fall in that spectrum? What did that first game do for you in terms of confidence, if anything? Well, they're both right. The games do not get any easier, but you do feel a lot better, especially having gotten the first one out of the way. You know what it's like. You've had 22 minutes of experience, not counting commercials, and that experience is as good as gold. I think that's why champions have such an advantage. You know, the first time I went all there, I was I, I was a nervous Nelly. I was sweating bullets, chugging water, patting myself whenever I could, all that kind of stuff. But the second game, I felt a lot better because I knew exactly what to expect. And you can read all the blogs you, you want, but you never know what to expect unless you have been through it before. So I think that helped. The games did not get any easier. The opposition did not get any weaker. I've played against some very, very strong players in my day. But I did feel a lot better as I went along. 
uh, compared to that first game. So that's one advantage the champions have, and that that's something that just cannot be quantified. Sure, I can imagine that. Yeah, I could see both sides of it. I can see that, you know, stepping on the stage as the returning champion, there is a pedigree there, and it's hard to not feel. It's not hard to. Not, I can imagine it's hard to not feel that pedigree as a returning champion. Um, it, it's not the it's not the pedigree so much as the experience. You know, I was like, oh, cool, I'm I'm a Jeopardy champion. I never thought, oh, wow, I am the Jeopardy champion. I thought, I get to play again, right? And I just get to play from a spot that's in a. a and in a different spot than before, a different lectern than before. I never thought, oh, geez, I'm the champion. I, I just thought, oh, I get to do it again, and I've done it before. So that experience was worth its weight in gold. Believe me. Believe me. Sure. One of the things, and this will be sort of in closing, but one of the things I appreciate about you, Ben, is how gracious you are when it comes to talking about the people you've played against. I mean, you are a very formidable Jeopardy player. You've won a lot, and you've been there a lot, and you are incredibly intelligent and incredibly skilled at this game. But to hear how gracious you are in describing your opponents and describing the people that you that you that you play with, I I just greatly appreciate that. And I wonder if you can speak to what Jeopardy has done for you in terms of the social aspect, the camaraderie, the friendship. What has Jeopardy brought to you in that arena? It's not measurable. Uh, gosh, I've made so many new friends, including some very close friends, as a result of this program and as a result of the character of the people who play on it. Uh, I still consider, especially Julia Collins, who was our captain during the All-Stars, and Seth Wilson, who was our teammate, who uh, actually was the Padre at our wedding. That, that meant a whole lot that he came down and did that. Uh, I still consider them very, very close friends, especially. They were my teammates, and we, we still keep in touch frequently. I love them. Uh, I married a Jeopardy contestant, although she was on. Uh, it, I, I don't know if I told you this, but Liz was in the audience, had such a good time that she tried out for the show, and she made it on herself. And she made a number of new friends doing that. And I've met the friends that she made and she mine. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful network. Jeopardy is a crucible. Being on there requires uh, a great deal of mental fortitude beyond just remembering things, which is literally the lowest form of human intelligence, just remembering things that other people have come up with. But it requires more than that as far as mental energy and mental strength and mental toughness is concerned it requires emotional toughness as well i know a bunch of shows require that match game among them uh <laughs> wheel 2000 among them all those <laughs> but th th this show's different because it gets so much attention because it's seen as the premier quiz show because it's seen as darn near a sport uh it really is a crucible and in a crucible of course uh, very strong bonds are formed. And I feel a bond with the people I know who have played, my opponents, my teammates, the people in the Invitational Tournament recently, in the All-Stars, in the 2014 Tournament especially. But in a way, I feel a bond with everybody who has ever played. The people I know personally, the people whom I've met randomly, the people whom I've reached out to just to say, hey, I remember you, the people I don't know. I think something like 14 or 16,000 people have appeared as contestants on this program. And I feel a bond with every last one of them. And I feel a great deal of respect for all of them, no matter what their finish is. Uh, it's a very, very special experience. It's unlike anything in the world. And one day I think you'll have a chance to do it yourself, Cribs. Oh, man, I hope so. God willing, man. United States. United States, man. I haven't said that in a while. You, you know where that came across? I just No, realized. tell me. Tell me. Okay. I was giving a talk at the Florence County Library, and somebody asked, what did you think about Arthur Chu, you know, doing all that bouncing around and everything? I said, it, it didn't particularly phase me, but you can pick any darn clue you want. I meant to say, this is a free country. It's the United States of America. But I just said, you could pick anything you want, United States. And I love it. I didn't realize that, <laughs> that I had said that until I had said that. But, you know, just 
United States, you do any darn thing you want. You don't have to worry about the law. You might have to worry about some blogs getting after you or some mean people on Twitter or other socials. But, you know, in the end, if you play your own game and if you stay true to yourself, then United States. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Christian Carrion, for my studio in beautiful downtown Lancaster City, Pennsylvania. Co-executive producer, Corey Anatata. Researcher, Chuck Donegan. This has been a production of Buzzerblog, the most popular game show website in the world, in partnership with the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. For more information, visit museumofplay.org. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Christian Carrion. Good night. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery and how it illuminates cultural history. And their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by bonusround.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at bonusround.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, The Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury.